to have the last, the last lecture by Tomek Lukowski. Uh, and please go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so today, finally, I will arrive to the amphitheatron. So, the the main topic of today's lecture is amphitheatron. So, let me just recall what we know so far. So, what we learned in previous lectures is that uh, there's this uh, geometric approach to amplitudes, or uh, I mean, motivated by amplitudes, uh, geometric approach to many observables in quantum field theories. Uh, which allow you to extract uh, observables, in that case, scattering amplitudes, uh, using some underlying geometry. And uh, the, the amplitude can be extracted from some differential form, which can be uniquely defined in this geometry. So the task always is to, to try to consider your problem in physics, uh, try to understand what geometry can, can be behind just by studying singularity of this, of this problem. So, for example, you have amplitudes, they have sing singular structure where some of the kinematic variables uh, behave in a particular way. And then in kinematic space, you can define a geometry uh, on which you define this uh, canonical differential form from which you can extract the amplitudes. So that, uh, so far in physics, I applied it in, in this bijoint or adjoint uh, scalar theory. But the, the first example uh, where this idea emerged was really n equals to four supernova mu, so the planar limit of n equals to four supernova mu. So what I wanted to focus on today is really uh, n equals to four super young meals. Uh, I add planar here, but one of the objects which I will define is, is also defined beyond planar limits. So uh, I will define two, uh, sorry, I, I will mention two objects. I will define just the amplitude because there is not sufficient time to define the momentum amplitude. But there are two objects which one can define, two positive geometries which one can define, which allows us to extract scattering amplitudes uh, in, this, in this theory. Okay. And for this two, so so in for scattering amplitudes, there there be two different definitions, and I will use the one which will rely on positive Grassmannian as I mean, the positive Grassmannian which we learned about yesterday, but there is another definition which uh, which is quite I mean more similar to the one which I uh, defined for the scalar theory, so this ABHY um, construction. So uh, just to mention that there are two definitions, but I will just introduce one of them just to give you a flavor of what what the object really is, uh, but with the, the caveat that it's slightly different than the kinematic associahedron in the ABHY construction. So the one which I will introduce today is uh, a definition using some auxiliary spaces. And this auxiliary space is just a positive or, or just a Grassmannian space. Um, so it's not directly in the uh, kinematic space. There is some auxiliary space on which we define an object, and then we can translate it back to the kinematic space. Okay, but there exists there exists a definition directly uh, directly in uh, the kinematic space of n equals to four superior meals. Uh, uh, in a similar way as we define the the associahedron, kinematic associahedron. So it, it it can be defined as a as an intersection. Uh, of uh, some positive region. So one can define what, what this positive region is. So I, I think I should say it's a, that intersection is just a single one uh, with some affine subspace. Okay, so similar, similar as we had for the ABHY construction, there was some a very large uh, kinematic space. In this kinematic space, we could define some positive part of it, so positive region. So all all the planar mandelstam sums positive. There is an equivalent thing, uh, thing which one can define for n equals to four. And then, uh, because the space is too big, one needs to restrict to some subspace. So one needs to do, one needs to define a affine subspace of appropriate dimension. And on this uh, intersection of these two spaces. Uh, we have a shape which is bounded shape with some boundary, very interesting boundary structure, and one can define a canonical differential form directly in the uh, in the kinematic space. However, the the original definition and the definition which is kind of easier to understand is this one, which is the uh, in terms of auxiliary positive Grassmannian. So I refer back to what what I told you yesterday. So yesterday I I explained that the hypersimplex can be thought of as an image of a positive Grassmannian true sum map, which is called the algebraic moment map. So this definition with the auxiliary spaces, uh, amplitohedron will be defined in exactly the same way. There will be a positive Grassmannian, there will be some map, which I will define in a second, and uh, the amplitohedron is just the image of this uh, of this map. And an important thing is that uh, similar as for hypersimplex, 
It is possible to just take positive gas minor, just know, knowing its properties and how they relate to the properties of the hypersimplex, uh, just starting from uh, differential forms, so canonical forms on the positive gas minor, one can derive the canonical forms of the hypersimplex so in the image. And the same thing will be, will be true here, just knowing positive gas minor, we will be able to find what the, um, what the canonical differential forms of the image, so the antihedron are. So just knowing the simpler objects, which is the positive gas minor, we can say something about this more complicated object, which is the amplitude But before I define it, I need to tell you something about which kinematic space we want to consider here. So uh, in, in phi cube theory, we had just Mandelstam variables. For n equals to four supernatural means, there, there are different kinematic variables which are more suitable to, to describe it. And there are two sets of kinematic variables. and. Uh, as you will see, so one of them will be relevant for the amplitude and the other one will be relevant, relevant for the momentum amplitude So kinematic variables in uh, n equals to four superregnions. Uh, so there are two of them. Uh, one of them uh, are more re relevant to scattering amplitudes, so objects which we're really interested in. But in in the planar limit, there is a relation between scattering amplitudes and Wilson loops. So there's the scattering amplitude Wilson loop uh, duality. Uh, so I'm not, this is only true for the planar theory. Uh, and therefore, we can use uh, the kinematic space of the Wilson loop also to, to describe uh, the scattering amplitude. So we can calculate the, the expectation values of Wilson loops. And uh, they will be defined in the so-called momentum twist or space. And then we can translate it back to the, uh, to the variables which are re relevant for the scattering amplitudes, which, which are the spinor helicity variables. OK, so these are two spaces. So, so the spaces which we have, since we have um, in n equals to 4, we have massless momenta. We can define, uh, we can define the uh, spinor helicity variables. So we can define pi equals to lambda i, lambda tilde i. And so these are spinor helicity variables. And uh, the amplitudes are, are not naturally uh, described. So in every four-dimensional massless theory, uh, that would be the, the set of variables. But we, we need to also add some fermionic, fermionic degrees of freedom, which take, take care of, uh, of, of the, the supersymmetry in the, in the theory. So there will be some uh, plus some fermion, fermionic degrees of freedom, which I, I will specify in a second in slight, slightly more detailed way. OK, on the other hand, he, uh, using the, the duality between scattering amplitudes and Wilson loops, we can define dual coordinates, dual coordinates uh, just by saying pi equals to xi minus xi plus 1. So if xi are the, the, the cusps of a polygonal Wilson loop, then uh, we can define momenta as differences of these cusps. cusps so, so the picture is something like this. There's an xi xi plus one, and then pi is here. Uh, and then the, the, the duality tells us that the expectation value, so the expectation uh, of this Wilson loop is uh, equal to the scattering amplitude. OK? And using this, uh, uh, using this dual coordinates, it is possible to define variables which are called momentum twisters. I will not define them here. Uh, the explicit form is not, not so important. It's just important that. For every particle, uh, so, so that there be there be n uh, momentum twisters, and uh, they will have index uh, a going from one up to four. So there are four-dimensional uh, variables. And then again, so so here here we have uh, lambda lambda tilde, which are uh, so there are four variables modulo uh, little group scaling. So three three variables. So <clears throat> massless momenta have three. Three degrees of freedom, uh, onshore and massless momenta. Uh, then, in in the in the case of uh, these dual coordinates, these momentum twisters are there's four of them, but they are defined up to every scaling, so they are defined on a protective space. So there are also three de three degrees of freedom. And also here we have fermionic degrees of freedom. Uh, so there are just some uh, Grassmann odd variables which I called chi, and they are also from so for every particle there's one, and a goes from one to four. Okay, so we have, uh, in this case, the, the, the R symmetry of, of the n equals to four, which is the SU4, R symmetry is explicitly written, and we have this index a uh, going from one to four. 
so in this language, so here on this side, we can define, and I will define what the, the, the geometry, which will allow us to find these expectation values of Wilson loops, uh, which is called the ambitohedron. Okay, and because we'll be able to find the expectations by of Wilson loops using the uh, the duality, we will know what the scattering amplitudes are. Okay, uh, importantly, let me just say once more: this duality works only in a planar limit, so uh, we will be we we'll, we will have access only to scattering amplitudes in the planar theory. <clears throat> But at three levels, there's not much difference between planar and non-planar. So since we are focusing on just, just on three level, then uh, there is a subtle difference, but 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 we, we can just say that it's in, I mean, it, we, we don't care about planarity here at the moment. Okay, so this is the, this will be the space where the amplitude is defined. So the, the momentum twister space, plus, I mean, it's a momentum super twister space uh, where the variables are the Zs and the chi's. And, uh, here, just just to just to complete this picture on the on the scattering amplitude side, we could also write uh, eta a. So we could we could write the, the Fermi degrees of freedom uh, for Fermi, uh, Grassmann odd parameters uh, for for a going from one to four. But in order to define a geometry, that's not a good thing to do. One needs to break the SU four R symmetry and reduce it to SU two times SU two, uh, and the correct variables are. Uh, two etas, uh, two original etas, which we would usually write uh, in SU4 language, plus two uh, eta tildes. So we need to break SU4 symmetry, the R symmetry, into uh, two copies of SU2. So A goes from one to two, A dot goes to one to two. <clears throat> the reason for that is that there is a pairing. So, so here we have a pairing. So for every index A here, so for every coordinate of our, our multiple twisters, there is a, a Grassmann odd coordinate. Uh, so this index A goes from one to four the same way as this index goes from one to four. So in order to define a proper geometry, we have to, on this side, we have to do exactly the same thing. So we, because we have uh, alpha, the spinner helicity variables, they have indices, spinner, spinner indices alpha going from one to two, and alpha dot going from one to two, uh, we really need to have also Fermi degrees of freedom with the same uh, index structure. So this A goes from one to two, they will be somehow coupled with lambdas, and then it tells us that uh, the A, A dot goes from one to two, it will be coupled, coupled with lambda tildes. Okay, so on this side, what we can do, we can also define a geometry. This geometry has a name, uh, it's called momentum antitohedron. Um, it's kind of unfortunate name. Uh, so uh, the amplitohedron is really an object which li lives in this Wilson loop space. So to be perfectly uh, correct, we should call it Wilsonahedron probably. Uh, and this object should be called amplitohedron. But uh, historically, this object uh, was called amplitohedron by Nima. And this object was introduced by me, uh, by, by Lydia Ferro and uh, uh, Matteo Palisi and uh, David, who is probably around. And uh, we called it momentum amplitude. Okay, uh, so I will focus only on on this side uh, amplitude. I will mention momentum amplitude in a second uh, towards the end, but uh, but I want to explain how the amplitude is defined. And I will just use the definition using the auxiliary space, so not uh, not the definition uh, with the subspaces directly in the in a kinematic space. Okay, so let's let's take a look how the definition is a. Uh, image of the positive gas minor looks like. Uh, and you can find this in the, uh, the paper of Nima and Yara Trunka uh, from 2013. And this definition, so I, I'll give you some even more general definition than is necessary for scattering amplitudes. Uh, but this definition uh, will have some, some number of, uh, of uh, uh, labels. So, so the amplitude will have some number of labels. Uh, it depends on number of particles. Uh, in n equals to four, we have also helicity sectors. So for every helicity sector, there'll be uh, a label. And then we, I will also introduce one more label, which I will explain in a second. Okay, so n for me will be the number of particles which scatter, or I mean, to be, again, completely um, <clears throat> correct, is the number of cusps in, in, in the polygonal Wilson loop. And k prime uh, will be the helicity sector. 
So every amplitude can be exp uh, exp uh, expanded in the helicity sectors. And I think that you had uh, this, this, this expansion was explained in one of the first lectures of, of the school. So I, I'm not uh, give any more details about that. So, so when we talk about K prime helicity sector, we are talking about N K prime MHV amplitudes. Okay, and then I will introduce one more parameter which I call M, uh, which is an additional parameter, which is not necessary for for uh, scattering amplitudes, uh, but this is a parameter that for uh, the physical case, so for scattering amplitudes. Uh, is uh, equal to four. So you can think about this as a space time dimension of, of the theory. So it is possible to define the amplitohedron uh, beyond uh, uh, n equals to four superangulus uh, scattering amplitudes. And I only focus on, so, so this, this, is a, this is an amplitohedron, but I only want to talk about it. I, I'll just give you the definition of the three amplitohedron, so three level uh, object, and I'll comment about loops uh, towards the end of this, of this lecture. Okay, so, so the amplitohedron, uh, I would call it A, it is curly A, it, it has this indices N, K, and then uh, M, where M has slightly different meaning, and uh, as I said, for a physical case, M would be equal to four. So I want to define now this object. In order to do that, I will need to, to, to prepare, uh, I will need to give you some other notions before I can do that. So what I'll do first, I will take uh, a Z, Z will be a positive matrix, uh, K plus, so K prime plus M times N positive matrix. So again, positive matrix is a matrix with all the minors, uh, maximum minors positive. And the size of this matrix, so the number of columns is N, so it's the number of particles, and the number of rows is uh, the helicity sector plus the dimensionality of the of the space time. So in, in the case of the scattering amplitudes, it would be K prime plus four. Okay, so this is a positive matrix and then uh, our construction will rely on this positive matrix. This, this, this matrix encodes the, the, the kinematic uh, external data. So the data of, of, of the scattering. Really. Okay, so we define using this, this matrix, we define a map which I call phi Z. So this, this would be a map which goes from uh, G plus K comma N, so the positive Grassmannian K prime comma N, uh, and it goes as a, so the image is um, another Grassmannian, uh, the, the size of the Grassmannian is K prime uh, N plus K prime. So the important thing is that this does not depend on N. So the image will be independent of N, uh, so the number of particles, uh, but it will depend on the helicity sector and uh, if we want to consider also uh, cases beyond the physical case, it will also depend on this uh, space-time dimension. Okay, so how do I define it? It is very simple. It is a very simple map. So I define it as uh, I take my Z. So Z, uh, so Z, Z are uh, this elements of this matrix here. I, I use this A here, capital A. Uh, it would be it would have slightly different range than before. So so just forget what I said before. So a here uh, goes from one m k n plus k prime, and i is just uh, the index which uh, which labels the, the columns. So so a labels the rows and i uh, labels the columns. So what I do, I take this matrix and I take an element. So here in the positive Grassmannian, I have a matrices. So so we explain what positive Grassmannian is. It's a set of all matrices modulo g l k. That's in that case g l k k prime. Um, so I can I can take a matrix C, and this matrix C will be will have some uh, elements which I call so the C alpha i. So this is a matrix which which has n columns and uh, k prime rows. So the, the rows alpha goes from one up to k prime. So what I do I just multiply these matrices. So C is a matrix and Z is a matrix. I can multi multiply them. So I just write it explicitly. Uh, this is a sum of, from i equals to one up to n. So I can multiply that. When I multiply that, I get an element. So I get a matrix. I get a matrix which has uh, a uh, columns and alpha rows. So it has uh, n plus k prime columns 
and k prime rows. So this is an element, so it's a matrix uh, of exactly this size, which I have here on the right hand side. And because C, so the matrix C is an element in a Grassmannian, then the relation which I, so the element which I find is, is defined up to the GLK prime uh, uh, rotation, which means that uh, really the, the element which I get at the end is not a matrix, it's, it's an element of the Grassmannian. Okay, so I call this element of the Grassmannian uh, Y. So Y alpha A. Okay, so that's the map. So I take I take uh, any matrix from the uh, positive Grassmannian uh, with this uh, with these elements, and I have a fixed matrix capital Z with this element, and just multiply these two matrices, and I get some element in the Grassmannian again, in this smaller Grassmannian here. Okay, so just just to say it once again, so Y is an element of G K prime M plus K prime Z is an element of positive matrices. Um, K prime plus M N and the C is an element of the Grassmannian, the positive Grassmannian K prime uh, N. Okay, <clears throat> so there is some there is some positivity here. Uh, so this is from G plus, this is from positive matrix, but this Y lives in the Grassmannian doesn't have to be positive. Yeah, so so it's exactly the, the comment which I wanted to make now. So the question is, is the image image positive or not? Uh, not necessarily. This element Y might be, uh, so it can be a non-positive matrix, so matrix which is not positive. So the image really goes to the full Grassmannian, not to the positive Grassmannian. Okay, and you can check it. I mean, it's not, not so difficult to check. Uh, yeah, I, I think that you need to go for K prime larger than one. If K prime is larger than one, there are some examples where you can really check, check that. Okay, so this is the map. So the, the map is called this phi, it's a map. Uh, and we will use this map to define what the, what the Grassmannian, sorry, what the amplitude is. Uh, in a similar way as the hypersimplex was the image of positive Grassmannian through the moment, the, the, the algebraic moment map, the same way the, the amplitude so the amplitude on uh, A, N, K, N prime is the image of this uh, a positive cross minus G plus K prime comma N through this map phi Z. Okay, so that's that's the definition what what the geometry really, really is. So in the in the case of hypersimplex, so if, if you also if, if you try to do the uh, thank you uh, K equal to K prime. Uh, it's K prime here. That's correct. Uh, I use it, I'm using K prime because K in scattering amplitudes usually is um, there's, there's a, a K which is defined as K prime plus two. So I, I'm trying to avoid using the K from the scattering amplitude um, uh, world. K prime is is taken from the Wilson loops uh, world. Uh, so what what I'm saying is that uh, similar. As hypersimplex is the image of the positive Grassmannian through the moment map, and we can we can see what the what the image is. If you if you attempt the the, the problem set three, then you will see that, for example, for uh, the image of G plus two comma four is a simplex, the kind of three dimensional simplex, very easy to visualize. Uh, in this case, because the the image is not in projective space, the image is in in the Grassmannian. Then, if k prime is larger than one. Then this object is very difficult to visualize. So if k prime is uh, is equal to two, and m is equal to four, then g prime, sorry, g k prime, the k prime plus m is uh, how many eight dimensional, and this is a very complicated object already. It's very difficult to to, to picture. If k prime is equal to one, and m equals to four. Then G, G K prime, K prime plus M is four dimensional, and it is uh, it is still uh, I mean it is still possible to to visualize it. Uh, it's, it's kind of easier, and importantly, because here K prime is equal to one, then this so G one one plus four that's just a projective space P four, uh, so that object for k prime equal to one is still a polytope, will still be a polytope. But beyond, beyond k prime equal to one, the object which we get, so the image which, which we will get lives in, in a true Grassmannian space. 
and its own curvy, curvy version of poly, polytopes. Okay, so it will be difficult to visualize, but there, because we know that it's an image of the positive Grassmannian, we know a lot about positive Grassmannians, uh, then we can use the information about positive Grassmannians in order to say something about the amplitude hydron itself. So in particular, uh, in a second, I will show you some examples for k prime equal to one, where, where something can be said explicitly. Uh, you will see that we can use the information uh, about G plus, uh, so the positive Grassmannian, to, to find the canonical differential form for the amplitudehedron, uh, the same way as we, we have done it for the hypersymmetry, just using the push forwards, as I, as I defined uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Z is fixed by kinematics. So uh, this, that, that's correct. Z that is related to kinematics. It's uh, uh, so that the name here is, uh, so it's a Z uh, because it should reminisce, I mean, it should be similar to the momentum twister variables, but this is, this is not really, I mean, the, the, this is something slightly different than momentum twister variables. And especially if you if you look at the range of indices here, so momentum twisters, the, 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 the upper index would run from one up to four. In our case, it runs uh, from one up to four plus k prime. And so this, uh, this variables here are called usually bosonized uh, momentum twisters. And I will tell you in a second how momentum twisters are uh, hidden there, or how su super momentum twisters are hidden there. So what, what we'll do next, uh, we have a, this geometry. We want to find, it, so it is conjecture that this is a positive geometry. There's no proof of that fact, but everybody, especially physicists, they believe that this is true. So this object is a positive geometry, and therefore we will define a canonical differential form on this object. And I will tell you how to extract uh, the amplitude from this canonical differential form. Okay, so I think that this is the next step which I wanted to do. Uh, so on this A M K prime M, uh, we can define we can define a K prime times M uh, dimensional uh, canonical, canonical form or differential form. Uh, which I would call omega n k prime m. So uh, just using the old notation, it's somehow it's omega uh, of uh, Grassmannian k prime uh, m plus k prime comma uh, a m n k prime. So the, the ambient space in that case is, the, is this Grassmannian and the shape, so the positive slice is given by the amplitude hydra. So I, I use this so this canonical form, I would just call it with, just with labels so that uh, I don't have to write so much. Okay, so we can define this. And uh, so it is possible to find, uh, and I'll tell you in a second how, uh, the canonical, so the differential form with logarithmic singularities, singularities uh, for all boundaries, of the amplitude hydron A M K prime M. Okay, so this is a logarithmic differential form, which means that uh, it's a canonical form. So there's a unique form which you can define on the amplitude hydron such that when I go to the boundaries of the amplitude hydron, which are quite complicated, but they're uh, quite well understood, uh, I, I always have a logarithmic behavior. And then when I, when I go to zero dimensional boundaries, so the vertices of this uh, amplitude hydron, then I find one plus one or minus one. Okay, uh, so that's uh, that. It is possible to find such uh, a canonical form, and then what one can do. So we are not really interested in this canonical form. What we are really interested in, we we want to find what the amplitude is, right? So all this construction, all this geometry was introduced in such a way that we would like to extract what the amplitude is. So three level amplitude in that case, and there is a procedure which allows us to do that. Uh, uh, there is. There, then there is a bit of intuition behind, but uh, I'll probably not go uh, into details how to how to arrive to this definition uh, to, to, to this way of extracting amplitude. I'll just tell you how to do that. But the important message is that uh, after you find uh, this uh, logarithmic differential form, it is possible to find the amplitude from it. Okay, so how to do that? Uh, so let's take our uh, Let's take our uh, canonical differential form. So this form is a function of, of y, 
and Z, right? So if you if you look look above, so this image here, uh, so the coordinates, so that the variables on on the on the ambient space are Y, and it will depend. So the image will depend on which Z we take. So this this differential form is really a function of uh, capital Y and capital Z. So Y is a matrix and Z is a matrix. So Y is an element of the Grassmannian, but we can think about this as a matrix, and uh, Z is a matrix. Okay, so this is a this is a chemical form on the so this is a a differential form on the Grassmannian G K prime K prime plus M, and it always uh, ha have so it always has this the following form. So there is a differential part uh, which I write here um, K prime D M Y alpha. Um, alpha going from one to k prime. So that's a differential part. So remember that this, this brackets, they, they just indicate some, uh, cap, my, um, some maximal minors of some matrices. So this is a matrix. You can construct a matrix with columns, uh, sorry, this is y1, uh, with columns y1, y2, y3, up to yk prime, and then attach to it uh, n copies of the column, uh, just of deriv derivatives of this d, dy. So this is, and then take the, the, the determinant of it. So this, it turns out that if you, if you calculate uh, the, the top dimensional differential form on, on this Grassmannian G K prime, K prime plus M, then uh, it will have this top, uh, I mean, this, this common factor, which is just uh, the standard, standard form, standard form on G plus, sorry, G before plus. K prime, K prime plus M times some function. So there'll be a function here. It's not a form, it's just a fu functional part of it, which I will call F N K prime M, uh, which is a function of Y and Z. So it's important that this is just a function. So the, the differential part it always factorizes. If you remember uh, the formula which I gave you, for example, for a simplex, then in the case of simplex, there was uh, a bracket which looked very similar to this one. And uh, it can always be uh, factor, factored out and then uh, it is multiplied by some function uh, with, with that, so there are no derivatives, uh, so differentials there and more. And this is true for any polytope. It, it, there'll be always a projective space standard uh, differential form times some function. So this is always possible to do this also for Grassmannians. And we, we will be able to extract the amplitude exactly from this function f here, okay? So the, the ampli amplitudes or three amplitudes uh, can be extracted from this f and k prime m y z in the following way. So we need to take very particular y. So we, you can think about this as kind of projecting to some, projecting to, to some very particular y uh, from the full grass plane to some slightly different space. So uh, the, 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 the particular y which we take, we have the following form. It's a matrix of all zeros uh, of the size four times k prime. And then the identity matrix of the size k prime. So that's a matrix with zeros and ones, so zeros and the identity. We'll parameterize the z, the z matrix as, so every z i will parameterize as this curly z are the momentum twisters now. Uh, I, I, I'm, okay, let me, let me just maybe use a small a here. So this is a capital A, small a, where a goes from one up to four. So these are momentum twisters. So four first coordinates are momentum twisters, and then k prime coordinates. So remember that this is this is a matrix. So this is a vector of size uh, m plus k prime. So in our case, there's four, four plus k prime. So four first coordinates are just the momentum twisters. And then the remaining k prime coordinates are uh, just phi one times chi i 
up to phi k prime times phi i as a chi i, where these are the, the fermionic degrees of freedom, so the, the supersymmetric part of the mountain twisters. Uh, fermionic degrees of freedom of the uh, momentum super twister, super twisters. Okay, and these phi's here, they are just uh, some uh, <clears throat> auxiliary uh, Grassmann odd parameters. Okay, and this dot means so, so phi one dot chi i it just means phi one a, let's use a small a now, uh, uh, phi i, phi one a chi i a, a goes from one up to four. So that's a sum over a. Okay, it's just, just a product of, uh, dot, dot product of this Grassmann odd parameters, phi, so auxiliary Grassmann odd parameters, uh, small phi uh, with the chi i Grassmann odd parameters, which, which are part of the definition of the momentum super twisters. Okay, so this is just, uh, so we take our function, uh, it depends on this y, it depends on the z, which is evaluated in very particular way, taking y in this particular form, and all z, uh, we just split them into a uh, momentum twister part, uh, the bosonic part of it, and then something which looks like uh, uh, bosons, there are still bosons because there are two fermions multiplied with, with each other, but there are this fermionic degrees of freedom here. Okay, and then when we do that, then in order to find the amplitude, we need to integrate, we need to integrate over uh, phi. Uh, so what we do, we, we find the amplitude n k prime at three level, uh, which is a function of this uh, momentum twisters and their uh, fermionic degrees of freedom. Uh, it can be found as the integral over all phi's in, in, in this case. So we, we have four phi's uh, here. I mean, every time we, we, we see we, we see phi one, phi, uh, phi two, up to phi k prime, there's four of them. So we need to integrate four times k prime of them uh, of this function f and k prime for y, z, where this y and z are the ones uh, which, we, which we had here. Okay, so that's the prescription. So if I have, if I have omega, so I, I start from, from the geometry, I find what the capital omega is. From this capital omega, I can find this function f, uh, evaluate it on very particular y's and very particular uh, z's, integrate over this auxiliary phi's, and then I get what the three amplitude is. Okay, so the simplest prescription, but it's a way to relate this geometry and uh, the, uh, the, this differential form on this geometry to the function which we want, which is the, the three level amplitude. Okay, so let me now uh, give you some examples, uh, maybe starting from very, very simple examples. Unless there are some questions now uh, uh, related to the, how to extract the amplitude. So in the, in the problem set four, uh, I, I will ask you to, to, uh, to follow this prescription uh, for a simple case of NMHV six particle amplitude. And you will see how it works. I mean, it's not very difficult in practice. It just looks uh, maybe uh, not, not so intuitive, but if you have the geometry and the, the, the chemical form on this geometry, you can find what the amplitude is. Okay, so let's see some examples. So uh, the simplest possible amplitudes are the MHV amplitudes. So the MHV amplitudes uh, in the momentum twister space, so in the momentum twister space, uh, they are equal to one, to one. So if you if one rewrites uh, the the scattering amplitudes using the scattering amplitudes Wilson duality, uh, translates the the scattering amplitudes into the momentum twister space. Then for MHV amplitudes, the answer is just one, and this is for all ends. Okay, so we would like to recover this one, and this is quite simple to, to see that we really get from our construction we get one because uh, if you if you look at the definition, so in the definition, uh, if MHV MHV 
cor correspond to k prime equals to zero. So we need to see our definition for k prime equals to zero. So in particular, we need to take this positive Grassmannian zero comma n, but positive Grassmannian zero comma n is just a single point. So no matter what z I take, uh, I get the image, which is just a single point. And then we know that if I have a positive geometry, which is a single point, then the, uh, the differential form, which I can define on it, is either plus or minus one. And if we take an appropriate <clears throat> orientation, then we can find that this is equal to one. OK, so g plus 0, comma n is a point, uh, which implies that a n 0 for uh, is a point, which implies that omega n 0 m is equal to either plus or minus one. We need to find proper uh, um, orientation, but we can always choose the orientation in such a way that it's plus one. And then from here, we immediately find, just following the prescription, that a3 uh, n0 is equal to one, which is the correct answer. So in the momentum twister space, NHV amplitudes are just trivial and are equal to one. OK, so that, that, that's a trivial example. Now we would like to uh, find something uh, slightly more, uh, slightly less trivial. So uh, let's take NMHV amplitudes. In that case, k prime is equal to 1. And as I said, uh, the Grassmannian, positive Grassmannian 1, comma, uh, so first of all, the, the positive Grassmannian 1, comma n is a projective space, positive part of the projective space, uh, n minus 1. And uh, the, the image, so, so remember that phi z uh, goes from g, in that case, g plus 1, comma n into g 1, comma 5. That's the same as P4. So the image also will be a projective space, which means that the image will be a polytope. So all the, all the boundaries will be really uh, linear boundaries and we'll get a polytope. And this polytope usually is called a cyclic polytope, um, but uh, the, the name is not important here. OK, so G plus 1 comma N is just a, a projective space. Uh, and if you, if you remember, when we discussed uh, positive Grassmannian, this projective, positive part of the projective space is nothing else than a simplex ray. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a um, embedding, it's a projective embedding of a simplex into a projective space. Okay. So now, now if we if you do that, if you take the image, the image through phi z is just a, a four-dimensional. Polytope uh, is a convex polytope. Uh, it's just, uh, just, just to write it more explicitly, it will be just a convex hull, so convex span of this uh, vertices Z1 up to Zn. Okay, so in that case, it's quite simple. And as I said, uh, if we go beyond uh, k prime equal to one, it will become more complicated. But for k prime equal to one, there is still a possibility of visualizing it. It's a four-dimensional object, so not so easy, but uh, but it's still a polytope. So in particular, we can think about triangulations into simplices uh, of of this object. Okay. So for every n, uh, the, this this object will be a, a four-dimensional convex polytope, and we can just triangulate it and use uh, these triangulations in order to find the differential forms. OK, so let's, let's see how it works for uh, n equals to 6, which is the simplest non-trivial example. So n equals to 6. So n equals to 5 is still quite trivial. It's an it's a MHV bar amplitude. Uh, anyway, it's, it's quite trivial. Uh, but uh, n equals to, to 6 is the first, first one, which is non-trivial. So what we have, we have a four-dimensional four convex polytope. Uh, with six vertices. Okay, so the six vertices are the zi i going from one up to six, and uh, it's uh, so. So the, the important thing is that uh, this four-dimensional polytope uh, can be triangulated into simplices using some images of three-dimensional. Sorry, uh, not three four-dimensional uh, boundaries of the positive Grassmannian g plus 1 comma 6. So this polytope 
can be triangulated, triangulated using four dimensional um, boundaries. So images of four dimensional boundaries. So I should say using images through phi z of four dimensional boundaries of g plus one comma six. So again, if you if you follow the the problem set three, then in problem set three, uh, a similar thing uh, happened for hypersimplex. So hyper hypersimplex was the image of the positive Grassmannian, but it could be triangulated or it could be sub subdivided by images of some boundaries of a positive Grassmannian. And the same thing happens here. And uh, for example, so the positive Grassmannian, if you remember from from yesterday, the positive Grassmannian is uh, all matrices of the following form for CI non-negative. Uh, so this object is a five-dimensional object. And it has boundaries, which are four-dimensional boundaries. And uh, you can check that it has exactly six of them. Uh, so I can take either C6 or C5 or C4 or C3 or C2 equal to 0. Or I can put this 1 to 0, and this will be the sixth boundary. So it has six uh, four-dimensional boundaries. And then what I can do, I can take the image of some of these boundaries. So if I take, for example, image of the following. So th these are all matrices, all matrices uh, on a four-dimensional boundary of uh, G plus 1, comma 6. OK, so this is a four-dimensional boundary. I can take the image of it, and I will call this image T1. And it turns out that if I take this image, uh, the image is four-dimensional. So it will be some subset of the, so I, I have this four-dimensional polytope. But if I take this image, it will be a simplex inside of this four-dimensional polytope. And it is enough to take two more simplices. So T2 phi z of, of the following one, C3 0, C5, C6. And T3 equals to phi z of 1, 0, C3, C4, C5, C6 with all the CIs non-negative. If I take these three images of these four dimensional boundaries of the positive gas minus G plus 1, comma 6, then these three simplices, they triangulate the amplitude. So I can show that the amplitude on 6, comma 1, 4, uh, is just the union of this, uh, just the union of these three simplices, and they do not intersect. So they, they only intersect all, uh, uh, along some boundaries of this uh, simplices, but they, they do, do not overlap. Okay, so if I take T1 with T2, so if I intersect, it's not, not empty, but the dimension of it is equal to three. So you have a four-dimensional simplex, another four-dimensional simplex. So T, there's T1 and T2, and they intersect along some three-dimensional boundary. OK, so there's something which I'll not show you that it's true, but it's true. It, it can be checked. Uh, you, can, you can try to vi visualize this four-dimensional polytope and, and try to see that these three uh, simplices, they really triangulate it. Uh, but just, just, just believe me that this is the case. So I need to take these three. Uh, sets of matrices and the images through phi of z and find these three simplices and they will triangulate. And now we know that if I have a triangulation of my polytope, then what I can do, I can find the differential form for the polytope just using the, uh, just using the, the sum of the differential forms, canonical forms for these three simplices. So for example, for because I know that there are simplices, so I can use the formula which we found in the uh, in the lecture two, and uh, if you look at the what what T one is, T one is just image of this all, all matrices of this form. It will be just a simplex. So T one is just a simplex with vertices uh, Z one, Z two, Z three, Z four, and Z five, and that Z six will not be there. So it's like taking out our full polytope and just removing Z6 as a vertex and just taking the five vertices 
and a simplex in, in four dimensions has five vertices. So these are the vertices of the simplex. Okay, so if these are vertices, then we know what the formula for the canonical differential form is. So the canonical differential form has, uh, you just look at the, the simplex uh, the formula, which I, which I uh, gave you in lecture two, and you find that this is the formula. So there is a, a four factorial here. Uh, y one two three four y one sorry two three four five y three four five one y four five one two y um, five one two three okay so so this is a simplex with vertices at z one up to z five and it has some boundaries so every simplex has five in four dimensions has five, five boundaries. And these boundaries are just given by this, this five denominators here. And then this denominator, some of this, so some of these boundaries, they correspond to the external boundaries of our polytope. And some of them correspond to, to the spur spurious boundaries, which are boundaries between the, uh, the simplex T1 and T2, for example. So I said that T1 and T2 are touching each other along a three-dimensional boundary. And one of these denominators exactly corresponds to this boundary. And then there will be a similar boundary between T1 and T3. So out of these five uh, denominators here, some of them correspond to the external faces of the, of the polytope, and some of them correspond to internal faces. Uh, uh, so the, the, the boundaries between the simplices. So ju just to have a picture in mind, uh, if I have a pentagon, and if I divide it into three pieces, then if I focus on one of the, of the triangles, some of the boundaries of this triangle are external boundaries of the pentagon, like this one and this one, but some of them are uh, spurious boundaries. So they're, they're just uh, boundaries between this, this triangle in the triangulation and another triangle in the same triangulation. Okay, so, so for example, in this case, this, this boundary corresponds to external boundary. And uh, in the language of amplitudes, uh, this, this boundary, so we know that the boundaries of uh, positive geometries should correspond to uh, singularities of amplitudes. And the six particle amplitude will have a boundary as uh, S12 going to zero. So one can show that if, if one translates from the one to twisters to, to Mandelstam variables, this boundary here equal to, so this expression here equal to zero corresponds to the boundary S12 equal to zero. Uh, there is a there is a question. Paolo? Uh, yes, sorry, J just a quick question. So, do I understand correctly that um, the image of the boundary of the positive Grossmannian is the same as the image of the whole positive Grossmannian under this map? No, uh, in, no. So the, the 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 statement is here. You need to take three band three. So so that that's that, that's the statement. So this one is the yeah. image of the full positive Grassmannian. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be split into three pieces where this one is a, a image of boundary one. This yeah. one is an image of boundary two. And this one is the image of boundary three. Where by boundary, I mean the boundary of the positive Grassmannian G plus one comma six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but then, I mean, so if you take the image of the union of all the boundaries, then you get the same image as the full object. No, like, notice but, that I didn't take all boundaries. I took some very particular so, subset of boundaries. So, so but, the, this G plus one comma six. So these are all these matrices. It has six boundaries, right? Yeah. No, but, indeed. Yes. But I took just three of them. So yeah. The and, one where the C six was zero. The one right. where C four was zero, and the one where C two okay. is zero. And only and with just three of them, you cover the whole image of the that's whole. Correct. Yeah. So so I mean, I guess that's that's what I. But is this always true? Like, can you always? I mean, what, what's the significance of this? That you on, only by taking, on, only by mapping some boundaries, you actually cover the whole object. Um, I mean, is this always true for higher cases as well? Um, does it mean anything? Yes. Yes. It's it's a very very important question. So. Uh, so notice the following thing. Uh, so if I go back to the definition of the of the amphitohedron, so in this definition here, uh, this space here has dimension uh, k prime times n minus k prime. This space has dimension k prime times m. Okay. If uh, n is large, 
then this space is uh, usually uh, much larger. So the dimension of the space is much larger than this space. OK, so this map is uh, infinity to, to one, right? So it infinity many times covers the, the, the image. Now, in order to find triangulation, you would need to, to find some, uh, some subsets here, which are mapped, which are of, dimension, of the same dimension as the image, right? So you, you would like to find a, a, a subsets here of dimension k prime times m, which will be uh, one to one on the image in such a way that uh, every point here uh, has, uh, has, I mean, has some preimage, right? And what turns out, and it's true for all n's, for all m's, and for all k primes, is that uh, the subset which we have to take here is, a, is an appropriate collection of boundaries of dimension k prime times m uh, in the positive plus minus g plus k, uh, k prime comma n. Okay, so there will be always boundaries of appropriate dimension, the dimension which you need to find k prime times n, m. And if you find appropriate uh, combination, uh, then, then you, can, you can cover the amphitrohedron uh, one to one. Okay, and the point is that uh, we know which combination to take because we are physicists and this, uh, I mean, it's not that we, we I mean, that it's not that the amphitrohedron was defined out of no, nothing. Uh, it's uh, there is a there is a long story towards the, uh, this definition here, and the point is that all of this. So let me go back here. All of this uh, boundaries in this particular case they correspond to BCFW, uh, so that the elements in the BCFW recursion relation. Okay, so if you know BCFW recursion relation, it is possible to find which combination of boundaries you should take. Okay, all right, but. But the, the, the statement is that there, are, that there always exist, not uniquely, they always exist a set of boundaries of the positive Graspanian such that the images that triangulate the amphitheater. Okay. okay. So in this case, the, the, there are these three, I, I can add these three ones, but I could also take the one where the five is missing, a three is missing, and the one is missing. And that would be a different triangulation of the same point. Okay, and okay. it gets much more complicated, of course, when you when you increase n uh, when you increase right. k prime. It's much more complicated, but it's a very well understood story. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so now now just just uh, talking about this uh, this boundaries here. So the uh, the singularities of these differential forms they will correspond to boundaries, and this one, for example, is a physical boundary where uh, when the s one two goes to zero, and similarly this one. Is a physical boundary when uh, correspond. So this singularity corresponds to physical boundary when s one uh, s two three equals to zero, and similarly this one corresponds to boundary when s one two three equals to zero, which are the physical boundaries of the uh, sorry, that are the external boundaries of the uh, of the amphitheater, but are physical boundaries of the amphitheater. But this one, for example, it it's uh, I mean both 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 of them are spurious boundaries. They do not correspond. They do not correspond to any uh, uh, physical singularity of the amplitude, but the point is that so they correspond somehow to this to this phases between the the simplices in the triangulation. But the point is that if you take now omega one plus omega two plus omega three, so add over all these three simplices, so this is what we call omega six comma one four. If you add three of them, then what turns out is that this uh, so the because the T1, T2, and T3 is a triangulation, then this singularities they, they just go away in the sum. Okay, so there will be a similar similar denominator in uh, say omega two, and then we, when you add them together and calculate the residue, the the, re, the residue is equal to zero. So this singularity disappears, and at the end what you get you get a, a differential form with singularities only on the external uh, external boundaries of the amphitrohedron. And there's nine of them, and they exactly correspond to uh, the, the physical singularities of the amplitude. So S i i plus one, six of them, or S i i plus one, i plus two, uh, three of them. Okay. So the so this this four dimensional uh, polytop, which we defined, you have nine faces, and they exactly correspond to this nine singularities of the amplitude. Okay. Okay, so that's the example which uh, which also you can you can now take and 
So you, you have an explicit formula for omega one, omega two, and omega three. It's very similar. It's just a relabeling of uh, uh, of uh, of labels here. Uh, so you know what the uh, the differential form for this amplitude here on six comma one is, and then what you can do, you can just go to the uh, to the procedure which I explained before and find what the three level amplitude is. Okay, there is a question in sugra n equals to eight sugra m would be eight, or does it have another meaning? Uh, yeah, so that's not not the case. So uh, we do not know uh, what generalization to supergravity of this construction is, and uh, m M is more related to the space-time dimension, not to the uh, SU4 of the, so not, not to N equals to four supreme wheels. So M is related to the four of the space-time dimension. Okay, so we would believe that M stays the same, but, but there is some, I mean, we, we do not have a construction for Sugra, so it's not clear what the generalization would be. Okay, so this was uh, this is uh, NMHB amplitude. So k prime equal to one. They are still quite quite simple. Everything is a polytope. You can triangulate it using simplices and find all the answers. That's quite simple. Uh, but if you go beyond NMHB, uh, so k prime larger than one, the the thing things complicate quite a lot because the amplitudehedron uh, a m K prime M, uh, it leaves in G K prime K prime plus M, and this is a truly uh, sorry. Let, let me put M equal to four. Four. Uh, so this is truly a grass minus space. It's not the uh, it's not the protective space anymore, and in that case uh, the object is curvy uh, and it's quite more um, it's more complicated. However, it's still can be triangulated, triangulated uh, in a similar way as we as we've done here using boundaries of the positive Grassmannian. So it can be triangulated by pieces that correspond corresponding to uh, to two different ways of thinking about this. To boundaries, so to images of boundaries of the positive Grassmannian G plus K, K prime comma n, or uh, PCFW terms. Okay, so we know which which boundaries to take because we know what BCFW recursion relation tells us. So uh, uh, the BCFW recursion relation gives us a, a particular triangulation of this uh, amplitude hydra. Okay, and then we can find the canonical form the similar, similar way. If we know the, uh, the triangulation, then we for each triangle, or in that case, some kind of generalized triangle, uh, we can. And we can find what the differential form is. We need, just need to add it and find what the canonical form for the amplitude on is. Okay. So then for three level, everything can be done just by hand. We just we have our space, we know how to associate uh, a canonical differential form, we know how to extract a three level amplitude from this canonical differential form. So uh, I mean if, if you want, you can you can just practice and and you should be able to do that at least for k prime equal to one, but also beyond. Um, so it's not not so difficult. Okay, so this is this is what I wanted to say about the, this definition of the amplitude. I'm just saying that it's a very well defined object, uh, uh, even though mathematicians would say that it's it's not proven that it's a positive geometry. We believe as physicists that it is a positive geometry, and we know how to find the canonical depression form. And in the last five minutes, uh, I'll try to explain. Two more things, uh, which is just just to mention what's the other definition of uh, the amplitudehedron uh, and how to think. I mean, how to think about the amplitudehedron directly in the uh, momentum twister space as a differential form directly in the kinematic space, and then I will mention uh, very very brief, briefly what the momentum amplitudehedron is, and uh, and then I will conclude. Okay. Okay. So so the, the first thing is that the amplitude amplitudehedron can be defined directly in the uh, momentum twister space without any auxiliary space, without any um, bosonized versions of this momentum twisters, momentum twister space. Uh, 
So the way the way it works really, so I did not define it uh, that the function is uh, you you can define a positive region and then you can define some affine subspace and the intersection of these two uh, will give you the amplitude. But the, the idea is that if you know what the three level amplitude is, so the three level amplitude, as we said, is a, is a function of uh, bosonic uh, momentum twister, so Z A, and the fermionic degrees of freedom, which I called chi A. So if you now take this three level amplitude and replace chi by dz, okay, so make it a differential. So the, uh, chi is a Grassmann odd variable. Uh, it behaves the same way as differentials as dz. And the number of indices here is exactly the same as the number of indices here. So if you just take that three level amplitude and just make this replacement, it turns out, so this is some differential form, which I call omega n comma k prime which depends on Z, A, and D, Z, A. And it turns out that this is, a, uh, so this is a, the canonical form of some geometry, which is well-defined geometry uh, directly in the uh, momentum twister space. Okay, so I, I promise at the very beginning to, uh, when, when I motivated everything, I, I promise that we will talk about uh, how to find uh, the, uh, how to find scattering amplitudes directly in the kinematic space. And there is a construction of the amplitude theorem directly in the kinematic space. In that case, the interpretation of the amplitude is slightly different than, than we had in this auxiliary space description. Uh, so the description, so that the, that the meaning is that it's a differential, it's a differential form uh, where the differentials work, work as Grassmann odd parameters, so the fermionic part of the this moment of super twisters. Okay, so this definition exists there, and then a similar thing can be done now. So one can define a similar object in uh, in the spin or helicity space. Okay, so so as we said, the the amplitude here lives in momentum twister space, which is more related to Wilson loops. But a similar object can be defined also directly in the spinal helicity space, which is the natural space to discuss uh, scattering amplitudes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so as I said, uh, amplitudes amplitudes in the spinal helicity space are functions of uh, lambda lambda tilde and eta a, but what we can do, we can perform a Fourier transform on the fermionic, uh, on two of the four fermionic degrees of freedom and turn it into a space which will be parameterized by lambda, lambda tilde, and then eta, and then eta tilde, where all this indices goes from one to four. And then finally, we do a similar thing which I described for the amphitheater, which is replace uh, eta by uh, d lambda. So th there is an index. The, the index structure is exactly the same, so we can do that. And then, sorry, let me, let me just call it alpha and alpha dot. And the same for eta tilde. So we just replace it by d lambda tilde alpha dot phi. And if you do that, then one obtains uh, the canonical differential form on a geometry, on a positive positive geometry, uh, on a geometry uh, which is called the momentum of the theory. Okay, so again, this this geometry is defined as some intersection of some positive region and some uh, affine subspace uh, of the kinematic space of lambdas and lambda tildas. Uh, so there's a shape there which is very well defined, and you can find the chemical differential form on this shape. And then if you know it, then you just do the opposite direction. So just take uh, the differential part of this chemical differential form and just replace this by etas and eta tildas, and you find what the three level amplitude in a spinor hasty space is. So this this was done yeah, just two years ago, as I said by myself and uh, Lydia and David and, and Matteo. Okay, 
And then just, just the final comment is that a similar construction uh, construction uh, for a, a similar construction to to the one which we have for the amplitude hedron can be uh, can be done for loop level. At the loop level, uh, we can define something which is called a, a loop amplitude hedron, uh, which describe which, which is a positive geometry which descri describes uh, L loop amplitude integrands in the planar inclus to four supering wheels. And there is a, a lot of and many many other examples where the positive geometries now play play a role. I I mentioned some, some of them already in my uh, second lecture when uh, I was talking about uh, positive geometries in, um, uh, in CFTs, uh, positive geometries in cosmology. Uh, but there is still a lot of open questions uh, about uh, I mean, how to use positive geometries uh, to, to find other observables in quantum field theories. Or even in N equals to four, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, like, for example, there's a question of how to generalize so this, this generalization only works for the amplitude hedron in the momentum twister space, uh, but we still don't know what the generalization to loop level of the momentum amplitude hedron is. So just to, just to conclude here, uh, I just wanted to say that the positive geometries is, uh, is an open uh, subject. It's a very rich and open subject, uh, and especially applications of positive geometries to, uh, to physics and to scattering amplitudes is uh, uh, there's, there's still a lot of open questions there, so I encourage you to uh, to just just think about this. And if you have some ideas, uh, please contribute, and hopefully we we can learn something more using positive geometries uh, to learn something more about scattering amplitudes in n equals to four and beyond, and hopefully n equals to eight supergravity as well. Okay, I think that my time is up now, so I'll finish here. So thanks a lot for for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice uh, uh, lecture, Tomek. So stop the recording. Are there any questions? So can uh, there's a question. Uh, can one hope to define a similar object in dual space before the use of momentum twisters parameterizing with some super conformal cross ratios? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, what, what one could try to do, one could try to take the, uh, the answer which we know for uh, in terms of momentum twisters and just directly rewrite it using the, uh, the dual, dual space cross ratios and see how it looks like. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any construction uh, there. And the reason is that momentum twisters are just very natural variables to, to consider that, I mean, that they simplify so many things. Uh, so people do not think about the, the dual coordinate. So when they, they when they think about <clears throat> dual space, they always think about one to three stars. So the, I think that the answer is it's not known, uh, but people are not so much interested in in, in deriving it. Uh, so yeah, so there's uh, uh, objects in cosmology. So uh, this is this is part of the positive geometry development, which I'm not so much familiar with. Uh, so there is an object, uh, which is a, a polytope, which is called a cosmological polytope. And uh, it allows you to find something which Nimar Kani Hamid calls the uh, uh, wave function of the universe. So uh, there, is, there is some observable in cosmology, uh, which you can derive using uh, positive geometries again. And, uh, but unfortunately, I mean, first of all, it would take some time to, to describe in which theories and what object it is. And second of all, I'm not expert on that, so I'm sorry I cannot can, cannot uh, say say much more than that. But uh, I gave you a reference in the Slack channel. There's a reference to the paper of Nima and uh, Paolo Benincasa and uh, Postnikov, uh, where this is explained. So so you you might want to just go there and uh, and just look. So I have a quick question. Um, so. Uh, when you're forming the Z matrix for the amplitude hedron, um, you're introducing a lot of extra variables um, <clears throat> um, to, to bosonize. Mm -hmm. So you, you have your usual, you know, fermionic, uh, you know, super uh, symmetric variables. And then, yeah, you, you have all these extra variables that, you know, you're introducing in order to, to bosonize. I wasn't sure um, what the reason uh, was for that. Like what, what is nice? Yeah, what becomes nice when you do that? 
So, so the, the thing is that in order to define uh, uh, geometry, you need to be bosonic, completely bosonic. So uh, that there, there needs to be a way to encode the, 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 the fermionic degrees of freedom of the amplitude, okay? And the idea which Nima had was that you hide them, you hide the fermion, fermions just by dotting them with other fermions, so auxiliary fermions. And if you, if you have two fermions which are multiplied with each other, they, they, they're a boson, right? So you can think about the product of two fermions as a boson. And in that case, it, all the space is bosonic and geometry makes sense, okay? But you don't need to do that. So as I, as I explained here, that, that the definition which I explained there is the original definition, which uh, uh, I think that Niemann does not like anymore. He prefers this one, where you, you don't need to introduce any auxiliary spaces. Uh, and there's a different way of treating the, the, the fermionic degrees of freedom. So instead of bosonizing them, you just treat them as differentials, differentials on your uh, momentum twister space. In that case, there's no, no additional degrees of freedom and the interpretation of it just changes. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I ask a quite naive question? Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, since these two amplitude, different amplitudes is describing the same things at the, at the end of the day, uh, have you ever tried to create a map to, to, to connect these two things? There is a map. Uh, the map is not... Uh, so... Uh, these two objects are related to each other, and yeah. um, there's no a direct map where, where you can just take a geometry uh, as, I, as I defined here, so this say bosonite sets and then just, just move them to a bosonite spinner hasty variable. So such map, I think, does not exist. However, if you take the amplitudehedron and try to triangulate it, uh, as I said, yes. uh, you, you triangulate it using some, some boundaries of the positive Grassmannian, right? So it's so BCFW, so called BCFW yeah. cells in the positive Grassmannian. Okay. Uh, you can do the same for the momentum amplitudehedron. You take momentum amplitudehedron and also triangulate it using. There is a different Grassmannian, uh, but there are also boundaries of this Grassmannian which triangulate and the images of them which triangulate the momentum of the hydron. And uh, okay. there's a relation, the very explicit relation between these cells. So, okay. so you mean a simplex can be connected, but, but the whole space cannot, but the whole geometry cannot. Is that what you mean? So, so what, I, what I'm saying is that the, the triangulations of the amphitrohedron can be connected okay. to triangulations of the momentum of the hydron. In the you mean the triangulation itself, not the simplex. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the combinatorial structure of the triangulations, but yeah, I don't know the map, direct map between oh. one and the other. I mean, there is a map between the spinner hasty variables and uh, the momentum twister variables, right? I mean, I, I've never tried to apply it really, but you could you could take the the canonical form uh, of the of the amplitudehedron written in this in this way, right? Yeah. And Yes. And you can use the map, which is now map between the momentum twisters and the spinner uh, hasty variables, and just see what happens. I never tried that. Uh, it's an interesting question uh, worth, worth trying, I think. Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, how crucial is Susie for this amplitude construction? Could one imagine a construction for, say, massless QCD? Uh, I think it's quite crucial. And the reason for that is uh, this trick, this trick here, uh, would not work um, for massless QCD. The, the fact that we have fermion degrees of freedom and the number of fermion degrees of freedom is exactly the same as the, the dimensionality of the space time uh, is an important ingredient here. And then we can just take this uh, Grassmann out parameters and treat them as differentials. Uh, it is much more difficult to think about uh, an equivalent construction for massless QCD because there are no this uh, Grassmann out variables. So the amplitude itself, it does not have, uh, so the, the amplitude itself is just purely bosonic uh, and therefore it doesn't have the properties of the differential form, which is a kind of a half fermionic object. So differential forms have there's DZs here, which are Grassmann, uh, which which uh, which have uh, a behavior which is like a Grassmann of variables. So it, it is a very interesting question, open question uh, to find some positive geometry for for massless QCD, but it is not known now, and uh, I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, 
we had a discussion in one of the tutorials, uh, so the tutorial on Tuesday about that as well. It's not so, uh, I mean, nobody knows at the moment how to do that. Any more questions? Yeah, I, I don't see any more questions. Okay, so yeah, let's uh, thank Tomek again for this nice set of lectures. Uh,